Hello, everyone. This is Carol Rosen. Welcome back to the Carol Rosen Show. For those of you who are new joining us, today we have the most special guest, a true icon in our time, who is the founder of the world-famous Venus Project and many other projects, ideas, writings. He's been in so many documentaries, lectures, written, and with his co-founder, Roxanne Meadows, we're truly honored to have these guests today because, as you know, many of you who have been listening to the show for the last year on listener-supported Thank You American Freedom Radio, we have been talking about how high technology, how services that can be applied to solving the urgent problems of the planet can actually change the world and cause world peace to break out. But there is no one on earth now who has the wisdom, the knowledge, the experience of a 100 years by the time some of you listen to this, it will be 101 years being on this planet this time around, than Jacques Fresco. He, his background includes so much interior industrial design, social engineering, the designing of really the human future and the future of other animals on the planet. And nobody, though, has an out-of-the-box, an out-of-the-mold approach that I've ever heard. I have followed so many very wise people who have been around a long time. Many of you know I worked with the late Dr. Werner von Braun. We had Buckminster Fuller. We had Isaac Asimov and just a list of fabulous people who were working on the systems that exist today. But really, the person who has the design and has been raising the money, thank you for helping him do that too, for the Venus Project with Roxanne, they've been building the dream, building the model. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But we're going to touch on the different aspects of life that are out of the mold, again, that uh, Jacques Fresco has designed many years ago that are about a new economics, a new kind of job system, a new security, a new military, education, communication, new ways of communicating, dealing with corporate, with entrepreneurs, dealing with the different issues, poverty, illness, the environment, energy. And these are all subjects that we're going to touch on today. We're going to also be hearing um, fr we're going to have people listening in from the new President Trump administration. We're going to have military officers, corporate executives listening in. And we have people from all over the world also will be tuning into this specific program because we're looking for the new ideas for how to have a new method, new policies for our survival because from what we hear from one of our guests, Dr. Guy McPherson, who has put together so many research projects, we're headed for extinction. And it could happen in the blink of an eye, but he says he can't imagine humans being able to live on the planet for more than 10 years based on what we've already done to the planet. So, um, Roxanne, I welcome you. Are you there? Yes. Thank you very much, Carol. It's a privilege and to be here. Thank you. And Jacques, we'd like to begin with you and hear your vision, hear what you would tell people right now um, that comes from your heart, from your experiences, your technical expertise, your designs that you have, innovations for new systems. So welcome to the show, Jacques. Now, if you had, say, the new president of this country, <laughs> say that you we have a political situation that's just in dire need. Actually, every issue is in dire need of your your perspective, your vision. So thank you for coming on with us. Please tell us about you and what your Venus Project is about to begin. Well, it starts during the Depression, the 1929 Depression. I was exposed to the bread lines and the many problems that existed at the time. And I learned a lot talking to people in those days. Mm -hmm. 
And does, does it feel to you like we're still in a depression? What do you feel like is going on today? Well, we're in a transition. Ah. The, 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 the public is not, does not have the confidence in their leadership anymore. They're losing confidence. And as long as the public loses confidence, they will not listen to ideas that are obsolete. Yes, maybe that's why we see so much protesting in the streets, which isn't obviously changing anything. But what is it that you're doing now with the Venus Project that could be maybe a model for us, new ideas? Could you tell us about your Venus Project ideas? Yes, it starts out with a very radical approach to our social system. We have to redesign the social system and bring it up to date with modern viewpoints. The viewpoints of, of our social operation are very limited today. They are yes. Not. I'm sorry, go on, please. They're very limited today, as I said, but they don't, they don't offer solutions to the problems. We offer solutions to each and every problem that confronts humanity today. And in your Venus Project, you're building, I understand, new ways that people can live that will solve these problems. Yes. We hear we hear about people working to solve problems, but why are they not being solved? What is wrong with the way people are thinking or creating right now? They're trying to solve problems within the limits of the system. The system itself is responsible for most problems. By giving uh -huh. people a set of values that no longer correspond with the physical world. Yes, the systems are definitely the problem. And, but we have people who think they, that they are conscious. They think that they have open minds. Do they? Because I don't see changes. I start to think I should be pre preparing for the emergencies of the extinction process. What do you think? I think you're right. Mm, yeah. And then we have to re-examine all our values and update them to see if they fit in with a new environment. If not, we have to change. We have to change our values to such an extreme that we may not immediately recognize the benefits of the changing values. Yes. And now we let's just take one of these issues. For example, that's a big one, the war issue. They're all issues are important right now, but the war issue. What I see from the work I've been doing for I'm almost 73. In fact, a few days after you turn 101, I turn 73. And what I've been seeing for my life work like yours is that Wars are continuing. And what are they using for a solution? Weapons. How? And now weapons in space. Oh, my God, they're going to put weapons in space. But you have other ideas for technology. Yes. How could we end wars with your ideas? I think by teaching people this new philosophy of life, where we have to care for other human beings, we have to declare all the other nations as one gigantic nation facing typical human problems. And we have to apply a humanistic point of view toward the human problems and take care of people. We, we don't spend any money on developing programs to enhance the lives of all people all over the world. You cannot have separate nations anymore. All human beings need the same thing, economic security, and they need to improve communication 
so they understand one another. This is so excellent to hear, and these are this should be integrated into the policies of decision makers right now. But let's just look for a moment. I mean, there's so many aspects of this: the technology, the economics. Um, the, the solutions for different issues, but let's look at economics. You have, do you have a new viewpoint for how to deal with money, with economics? Yes, you can use money. Money corrupts people. And the incentives are changed without money. In other words, we are headed toward a moneyless society. As you automate factories, you lay off people and they don't have the purchasing power to buy the products turned out. And you can, you can use automation alone. You have to change the values and go with it. In other words, if you use the same values, they got a sin of this mess. You can't solve problems. Those values. And, and ha, ha, yeah. uh, I'd, I'd like to say, I'd like to jump in here a bit. Um, all of our values are perpetuated, <clears throat> all of our values are perpetuated and generated by the social designs that you grow up in. If you grow up in a socialist country, you might have more notions of cooperation. If you grow up in a free enterprise system and the monetary system, you, you are, everybody is out for themselves. Everybody is a vulture off of somebody else to take care of their own needs. Um, this, this really perpetuates mass suicide eventually is what we're wit witnessing. So, um, and we have always had some method of exchange and we, because we have always had scarcity. But today we have the technology to be able to produce abundance for everyone's needs. So we don't need to perpetuate this old method, this old system that no longer really works. It never worked for the better betterment of people and the protection of the environment. So Jacques has spent his life starting from witnessing the Great Depression and seeing that there were things, there were products and store windows, there were, um, there were manufacturing plants that were technical people that wanted to work, but he realized that they were thrown out by the millions, thrown out into the streets and, and food lines because they did not have money in their pockets. And he realized it was the rules of the game that we play by that no longer worked. It, it never worked because it never took care of everyone's needs. So he had a search his whole life to try and find a system that would work. He looked into communism, socialism, mankind united, technocracy, all the systems that they talked about on soap boxes in the middle of the streets because of this deprivation during the, the Great Depression. And none of them, he felt, satisfied his needs or people's needs. So he had a, his whole life worked on an alternative, an alternative global social economic system, a holistic system that was corresponded with the caring capacity of the Earth's resources and used our technology for the betterment of people, which is quite different than what we have today. It's diabolically opposed to the free enterprise system, which the goals are wealth, property, and power. You can no longer strive uh, along those lines as it produces hostility among the different nations. We have to develop a new language that has uniform meaning. A language is that of a blueprint. When you design a blueprint for a building or a car, and you give that blueprint to any manufacturer, if they've learned to read blueprints, they can turn out the same thing without 
interpreting it in the wrong way. Explain more, would you, Jacques, about, and thank you, Roxanne, about the new language that we need, new blueprints. Well, the uh, blueprint has to have all the spe speculation and the product will have. When you give a blueprint to a factory, they turn out the same product. When a doctor writes a prescription, and of course to any pharmacist, it comes out the same way. It's never reinterpreted. In other words, when you read a program, you project your own values into it. And your own values are based upon early early conclusions that didn't fit the conditions even then. For instance, if people read the Bible, they have, somebody has one interpretation, and then they turn into the seven-day Adventists, and then other people read it, and they have other interpretations, and it turns into the Protestants, and, and this goes on and on. When you pull out a blueprint and you read it, it's not subject to interpretation. Science is least subject to interpretation if it has a physical referent. And in the future, language, you teach kids language with a physical referent. So it's not somebody's opinion or interpretation. You can yes. check it out. Go ahead. And you can check everything out by computer. And this is what we say the social system has to be based on the methods of science, not somebody's wishes or aspirations or ideals or, or religious backings, but the methods of science applied to the way we live. That's right. For instance, we've never given science the problem of how to design a society without booms and busts, with clean sources of energy for everyone, with so people's needs are met. Everybody has the same needs all over the world. They all need clean air, clean water, arable land, a relevant education, love, warmth, um, and good medical care and good nutrition. For everyone. That's right. And if you leave certain people out to the extent that you leave them out, that's the that's the amount of problems that you will have. So you've never had had science have an unprecedented mobilization toward making a better society that improves everybody's standards of living, not just a few. And if you do that, everyone could obtain a higher standard of living than the wealthiest today. I know Larry King once said to Jacques, Jacques, you're so smart, how come you're not wealthy? And Jacques said, you're wealthy, how come you're not smart? <laughs> yeah. And how do you deal with that issue, Roxine and Jacques? I mean, you both are world-recognized, and Jacques, congratulations on your UN-related awards and your many awards. Um, and Roxanne, you're known internationally, technical scientific medical illustrator, architectural designs, both of you, and you have this new city design model. On the other side of that, and with Jacques, who has so developed these out-of-the-box concepts for the context of sustainable living structures, of new inventions, and you mentioned computers, Jacques, how do we actually educate people, promote or what do we do with the people who still have the profit mode, number one, who also talk about God and our nation? How do we deal with that? Because that's really a, pro it's a profoundly important concept, concept in the decision making process, especially in this country where we go to one war after another and in God we trust for the sake of our national security. How do you deal with that? How, how should we? By, by adhering to the scientific method and testing all hypotheses. All hypotheses have to be tested. And if they work, keep them. If they don't work, move on to something else. In other words, we have to experiment and live with different systems to prove 
that our system works. You know, the system we have today is an established system, and those who are in positions of, inc- of control and, and positions of differential advantage want to keep the system as it is. They are living well. They don't know enough about another system, how that could be beneficial for them until they see it. I think then they might consider that this would work better for them. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're raised in, in this system, which is the free enterprise system, then all of your values are there to support that system. And what people don't understand is the values are to support the people who are in those positions of advantage. It's not to support the everyday person. So war is also a result of the monetary system. There's a lot of money in war. And and fewer and fewer people are are um, benefiting from the wars. You know, in the past, when there was a recession, they would have a war to get people out of it. After the Great Depression in the 1920s, the war brought us out. And um, many people benefited. Today we have wars all over, and it's not bringing us out of depressions anymore because there are only few corporations benefiting. And they're really not benefiting, if they understood. That's true. There's only one organization in the world that doesn't use money. That's a public library. You go in there, you can take out as many books as you want to. If you talk to the librarian about what she wants a book for, she will help you. And you don't have to give many money. So the public library was always jammed with people seeking information. And it was a wonderful idea, the public library, using no money. It's the only organization in the world that uses no money. And Jacques wants to expand that that identification with, with the library. And he advocates something he came up with called a resource-based economy, where we eventually surpass the need for money because that hinders our dreams and it hinders what we're able to do in all aspects of society. A resource-based economy would not use any money, any barter, any credit, or no servitude at all. We can do this today because we have the technology. For the first time, we can do this. We could, we could produce abundance all over the world. And we can supply people's needs so they don't have to go to war. We don't go to war to bring heroistic notions of democracy or freedom. Those are the words they give people to die for. Those are only empty words. You can't have... When is the last time you voted for wars or you voted for bridges or you voted for roads or you voted for how food should be produced, whether it has toxins in it or not. There really is very little democracy, and there's very little freedom in this culture. We say you're about as free as your purchasing power today. That's true. And when you're talking about your resource-based economy, and you have designed a model city, right, in yeah. Florida that people can visit. Could you talk more about how that resource-based economy works in your model city, and what do you have set up there? First, first thing you have to do is a survey of the Earth and its resources to mm-hmm. see what the Earth can provide. And you have to maintain a population in accordance with a survey conducted. You can't have more people than the Earth can support. You have to figure out first how many people the Earth can support. And then you have to design a society to fit those programs. You just don't go on reproducing. People that are fairly well educated do not have as many children. And sometimes that scares people because they think shock wants to kill people and keep a certain population. That's not true at all. People are getting killed today because of the monetary system, because there is not 
enough equal distribution of food and medical care and housing and and mental health um, care. So, but we are saying that we have enough resources if we use them wisely, but we don't have enough resources if we perpetuate the monetary system. And how do you, I'm sorry, go ahead, Zach, please. Well, I beg your pardon. What were you going to say? I, I'm, I don't know what you said. Uh, I was going to ask you about um, the resources that we have that we see, in fact, in so many parts of the world have been destroyed by wars. I mean, if you watch international news, not the United States corporate owned news, you actually see footage of whole towns of hundreds of thousands of people sick. The towns are destroyed. The children are living in rubble. They say there are now close to 500 million orphans. And yet we're still, it sounds like, other than your work, we're set, we're still building and developing with the same way, old way of thinking. So how do you get to the place where you can actually maintain, well, I love your idea of support, of actually doing the research, survey the earth to see what the needs are. How, how do you do that? Is anyone doing that? Or are they using computers to do it? How does that work? Use computers and automation. When you use automation, you have to make sure that the public has income, has access to resources. In other words, we have to build access centers where people have access to anything they needed. In other words, next door to the public library, you have a camera shop. And you go in there and check out any kind of a camera you want without payment of any kind. Next door to the camera center, you have musical instruments where you pick whatever instrument you're interested in playing. And you, you make things available to people. If things are made available to people, they do not steal. They cannot steal. If things are available, why should anyone break in to your house and take your TV set when they can get one at the access center? They can check it out for as long as they need it. It's easier to educate people and have them be a, a contribution to society than put them in jail. Putting people in jail doesn't, doesn't deal with any problems. They don't learn anything new. In fact, they learn more about criminal behavior and how to get away with it. They don't learn anything new. So prisons and police have to be diminished. And you cannot monitor people anymore. You can't monitor their personal lives. Because they always end that. Yet you have monitors. You have cameras all over photographing what people do. It's photographing what people do that tells you what's wrong with the system. Today, the, the, the people put the blame on the individual. They think people are born greedy or bad. Um, people are not born any which way, but the values, as I mentioned, are generated from the culture. You're not born with greed, envy, bigotry, jealousy, anger. That's generated within the environment. You know, Jacques always says we can't think or reason, meaning that everything you learn, all the words you say, all the expressions you do, how you walk, how you talk, are picked up by the environment. You don't have your own words. Your culture, your country gives you your words. That behavior, your behavior reflects your environment. There really is no individual to blame. Instead, you have to blame the society that generates the behavior that we get and change the society if you want a different type of behavior. But you can't have a cooperative, constructive behavior. You can't superimpose ethics that you want within a society of scarcity 
and the monetary system where we're all vultures after one another to get what we need and we're responsible for our needs. In other words, nothing is self-activating. We're, people are always acted upon by outside forces. And that we mean that plants do not grow. They need water. They need sunshine. They need arable land. Land itself has to take things from the environment. And if the environment doesn't provide those things, the plant dies. And it's the same thing with people. People are generated by their environment. You might have tremendous ethics superimposed upon people and they wouldn't steal. But if they have a child and a wife and they have nothing, they might steal no matter how many ethics you superimpose upon them, no matter how many treaties you sign, if a country needs materials or resources, they'll go in and take them if they have the armies and the navies. Where did we get America from? Where do we get this land from? We stole it from the Indians. The Indians were not able to fight back. They didn't have machine guns. They had bow and arrows. And the Indians had no means of organizing a system that could combat the free enterprise system. Although the free enterprise system is, is work within the laws of the, of the designers of the system. The designers of the system want to keep things the way they are because it keeps them in power. What everybody wants is power over others. And those who control purchasing power have greater influence. Mm -hmm. They can lobby, they can bribe, they can persuade government officials to make the laws to serve their own interests. This is the way the monetary system works. We don't realize that today because propaganda is in every magazine. Every broadcasting studio, in other words, broadcasting studios depend on the sale of cigarettes to keep them going. And so, so long as they depend on the sale of materials, I cannot attack the materials. Mm -hmm. If I attack the materials, I can't change the system. So what you have to do is inform the public as to the garbage they're getting on the newsreel. They're not getting information. They're getting monitored news, which is edited to fit the circumstances of the free enterprise system. If you're brought up in France, you speak French. If you're brought up in China, you speak Chinese. You pick up the Chinese customs. There's no such thing as an individual in China. Or America. Uh -huh. Americans are turned out with certain values that support their system. Otherwise, the system cannot thrive. You know, you can have a soldier that gets his arms blown off or his legs blown off and he doesn't have any home and he's in the streets and he still waves the American flag. He doesn't understand what it is that he's fighting. All of your values are given to you. They're pumped in at a very early age to support how to support the culture you're raised in. How else could they get people to go to war for them? If you were brought up in Nazi Germany, where Hitler burned all the books, that would change your views. You become a Nazi. The difference between a Nazi soldier and an American soldier is the environment they're raised in. It's geographical. It is not the American way of life. And what, what is the American way of life? How are we brought up that uh, we can change? Yes. Well, they have to be introduced to a new system. You know, people are beginning to realize that um, that technology is displacing people and that we won't have the purchasing power pretty soon to buy the goods turned out. This is the end of the free enterprise system. You know, it's cheaper to automate than to go abroad with cheaper labor. 
but they can't stop automation. They need to be, they need to have the competitive edge. It's like a cancer on a cat that eats its host. So people really aren't emotional or intellectually well versed to step back and say, what is it that we need? They blame one another. They look for a scapegoat to perpetuate the wars and, and to keep selling the products. You know, as I mentioned, war is a tremendous business. One of our biggest businesses that we have. So we, you really have to wait till the system for the march of events. So the system dies. Enough people lose confidence in their elected leaders. Enough people lose their homes. Unfortunately, enough people lose their families because of it and lose money and their jobs because of automation. And then they look for something else. They realize something's wrong. So we feel we need to get this alternative out there, a resource-based economy, how we can live together and um, share resources and eventually do away with the artificial boundaries that separate people. And it becomes, you know, technology is, it, our problems are technical. They're not political. They're not religious. They're not psychological. They're, they're technical. It's technology that gives us clean water that's disappearing, it could give us clean water, that could give us clean energy, that could give us a good medical, Amen. yes, could give us a clean medical system. You know, even everything in the sciences and the monetary system are polluted because of the need for money. It's not the, we're not blaming anybody. You just have to maintain that standard of, of money over the well-being of people to make it in this world, really. And um, so they're polluting the earth, they're polluting the air, they're polluting the water, their medical care is, is, is for money more so than in the older days where they cared more for the people. It's become a business. Everything has become a business and polluted the earth, really. And it's just suicidal, as I mentioned before. Um, so if we, if we don't get this alternative out there, I, I know of no other group that is working on an alternative other than spin-offs from the resource-based economy that Jock has talked about. They're understanding that the system is falling apart, technology is taking over, they're beginning to write about it, but they have no answers. It's happening all over the world. Not yes. just America. They're trying oh, to do oh, oh. patchwork within this system, and you can't do it. It's the system itself that's causing the problems. It causes planned obsolescence to make things, to wear out and break down. We get rid of food to prop up the prices. The earth is being plundered for profit, and we're creating our own extinction, not even to mention climate change is a result of all of this and they don't face it. So um, unless we change the system and we work toward another system where we can live in peace because we don't have the, the money that initiates these problems and people think, well, can't we just elect ethical people into government and everything will be all right? It won't be all right. You can have the most ethical people in government. And if you run out of resources, you will have lying, stealing, cheating and all the problems that we have today. We have to learn how to live together, share our resources, use our technology intelligently to produce abundance all over the earth, to make clean energy, to, um, and, and we feel that if you try and do this, Jacques' architecture is very, very different. Um, it, if you look at his, if you look at our website, the venusproject.com, you'll see some of his designs for city design where you just you have multidisciplinary teams that produce one eighth of the city, making it very efficient, making it redundant, making interchangeable parts, using the least amount of materials to cover the most space. 
And this is building and designing criteria for a resource-based economy, meaning you want to house, feed, clothe, and take care of everybody on Earth so they can participate and be productive and and um Everything that they develop goes back into society. Without money, you don't need patents. You don't need, you don't need money for research in your own labs. You know, that people say that the monetary system make, creates incentive. It doesn't. You need a lot of money for your lab. You need money for patents. You need money for universal patents, world patents. You need money for lawyers. You need money for manufacturing on a massive scale. You need money for advertising, so it really inhibits incentive for creativity. So in a resource-based economy, you encourage people to be creative. It's being creative, you have to understand what makes people creative. And Jacques has, has undergone this search all his life. If you're designing an entirely new social design, you have to look at everything and, and critically search and understand what makes people creative so you can teach that. It's nothing inborn. Some people are not born more creative than, than others. It's the environmental circumstances that make them that way. And if you know what those circumstances are, then you can reproduce that environment so we can make children creative. And we can make them cooperative when they don't have to look out for themselves to support themselves. So it, it really is not just new architecture, but it's a new value system that we're promoting. But the architecture that Jacques designs where you create one eighth of the city and then you duplicate it, that uses a lot less resources, but you, you, maintain a very high standard of living as well. His cities are immersed in beautiful gardens. Everybody has access to the access centers where you can check out anything you want. If you use it all the time, you keep it. If you don't, you bring it back. It's kept in key shape. Then other people can use it. Um, you're always studying everything that's made to make it with least amounts of materials, to make it more efficient, to upgrade the materials. And so it's a constant state. It's an emergent society, not an established society. You're, we're not afraid of change to make things better. We, we, we celebrate to, that. We have to condition people to expect change. Mm. And the, t the type of change has to be expressed. So that they, they, not, they, they don't have the rug pulled out underneath them. People don't know what's happening in the world, they say. What's happening? They no longer use my profession. All professions will be phased out because as long as automation can phase out the work of an individual, especially if it's monotonous, it can phase that out. So you're moving toward a world that doesn't employ people. It employs machines, and eventually the public will develop a distaste for machines and try to go backward. It can't go backward. They put, you can only go forward. They put the scapegoat on machines today, but that's not true. It's uh, the misuse and abuse of machines that you should be wary of. And, but People are rightfully afraid of machines today because, you know, they lose their jobs, they lose their money, their houses. Um, but the Venus Project eliminates the disastrous consequences of, of the approach we use today with machines. You know, machines are used for drones and war weapons. So... I can understand how they're afraid of machines, but when you, within a resource-based economy, when you don't use money, it's not in the scenario at all. When you get a better machine for where you're working during the transition, that means a shorter work day, more time off with your family. It means more purchasing power in the terms of resources, not money, but what you can, what, because that's shared with everybody. When you have a machine today that makes more things quicker, why are the prices going up? They should be going down, but they're not. Certain people are getting very wealthy. 
And um, it's not really to blame certain people because businesses aren't to blame. <clears throat> They're forced to operate this way under to retain the competitive edge, edge under the monetary system. So it's the system that has to be changed, not the not just the people. If you change the system, the people will change as well. But we have to have enough people understanding this new resource-based economy so they understand the need to initiate it. And you can't, you know, within building the first city is what we would like to do. You can't maintain a high standard of living for everyone when you maintain the old cities like New York City. It's just a tremendous waste of energy. That's why we have uh, uh, people who come Saturdays. They come here Saturdays and they ask all kinds of questions. And that's what we want. We want people to question everything, even the values they've learned. And religion doesn't offer anything except in heaven there's no private property. We know that. We know that in heaven nobody owns anything. Everything is cooperative. And everybody gets their needs met. That's why it works. But they don't think about it. We really want to translate all the religious teachings, all the philosophies, all the great idealists of our times and history into a working reality here on earth. You don't have to wait till you die and go to heaven. What a story. It keeps people under control and quiet and, and, and accepting the conditions that they have today. Because after you die, if you do everything correct, you can go to heaven. We want to produce that heaven here on earth. I don't see why religious people would be upset with what we want to do when they learn about it. We, you have, this is so incredibly profoundly important for people to hear, especially about preparing for this change. You're talking about a whole new way of thinking. Mm. And that's something I'd like you to talk more about, too, because what isn't happening in the decision-making world where I work in the military, industrial, lab, university, intelligence, supposedly, community, uh, government, government's complex and the space aerospace industry, which you, Jacques, have worked in, and you're a pilot, a private pilot, so you're into that aerospace top world, too. The thinking hasn't changed too much, or has it? Are you seeing a change? Yes, because in the future, everybody will be open to new ideas. You know, they, um, our technology is racing forward. But our social design and our values are not. They're still stuck from centuries ago. We still, in many ways, live our ancestors' lives, but with new gadgets. So, and, and how we're using our gadgets, you know, our schools are getting better equipped than ever. But our weapons and our, our bombs are getting worse. There's something tremendously wrong with our society that that's happening. You can't keep bombing people and expecting no resentment. When you kill your, if you're a child and you kill your father and mother, you know, another country coming into your country, not asked to be there, but they kill your parents and your relatives and bomb your house. And, and that child has, is raised with revenge and religion. I don't know what you expect. Why well, you're surprised that we get bombed and retaliated. I'm surprised they haven't done it more. You know, we, we export so much hate and torture and weapons. You know, it's not the technology people should be afraid of. It's people that use it. It's people that create the bombs. It's people that create the racks. It's people that create the torture. A lot of people believe that machines make produce hell on earth. They do not. It's man that drops bombs on the cities. It's man that tortures other people. It's man that destroys the environment. Right. It's not machines. Machines never turned against anyone. 
I think that was Arthur C. Clarke that said something like, I'm paraphrasing, if there's ever a war between man and machine, he would sure know who started it. <laughs> yeah, and we have now um, the leaders of Russia and China actually saying they're ready to make an agreement to not put weapons, for example, overhead, which during yours and my lifetime is the next plan. The rumors are that they're already there, but they're not. And they, we in this country have a whole group who want to base weapons in space to dominate and control everyone and everything on Earth from space and everything in space from space. But fortunately, the only the countries of Russia and China have introduced this agreement, actually called a treaty. They know everything is designed to get broken. But that's the agreement that could take place. I'm wondering if in your Venus project you are getting support from any community or international leaders, corporate leaders, as you have so many visitors coming. Do you have those kinds of people supporting this concept yet? No, not really. We have individual people who oh, no, own businesses somewhat who really call us and admire us and come to the tours, not so much actively supporting it yet. Um, it really needs the scientific community to do that as well, everybody. But we get people from all walks of life. We, we have tried very often to approach certain governments without any luck. I know Jacques had, had experiences with governments when he was younger, before I met him around 41 years ago, with Humphrey. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to reach people within the culture, but not having the medium to advertise the Venus Project, I can't get anywhere. You can understand why this is not on corporate media. <laughs> they don't want anything to get in the way of, um, you know, know yeah, of, of their own demise. You know, they will hang on to dear life as you can see what's happening. <laughs> the, so um, really you know, I, go ahead. So I was just saying it really depends on and educating people in any way we can. Um, we're targeting all sorts of people. But, you know, politicians are really there not to change things, unfortunately, but to keep things as they are and to serve the interests of those people who put them in, which are mainly the large money interests. So we don't really feel that it, it will come from politicians Although it should. Well, this is what, one of the reasons we're doing this show is to reach decision makers. I'll talk more about that in the next segment. And I look forward in the next segment to hearing both of you talk about more about the Venus Project and how the world leaders can tune in, how the media can tune in, and how we can reach the people of the military industrial lab and so on complex. We will do that with this show. That's why American Freedom Radio is allowing us to do it. Thank you. We'll be right back. Stay with us, everyone. Welcome to the world's meeting place. American. It's practically narcotic. Freedom. Oh, yes. I like very much. Radio. You're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. We want the peace on Earth and in space. We're not alone. And we're back on the Carol Rosen Show with Jacques Fresco. Within the 101, 100-year-old bracket on this, on this planet now, the leader and the founder of the Venus Project with his co-associate, his co-partner, Roxanne Meadows. And we're going to be hearing now more about a global resource-based economy. What would a city, what would a community, what can the world look like 
we need the scientific community to participate because we're heading now into fields of technology that lead us all the way into artificial intelligence, automation, the machines and technologies that Jacques talked about, the models that Roxanne and Jacques talked about too, are now going to be built or we will continue to choose the wars war machine. But we're doing this show without any blames. American Freedom Radio's rules are no rules, no taboo topics, no fear of doom. So we're not wanting to focus on the negatives, but we also know that we are in desperate need on this planet for solutions, for new vision. And there is no one more wise of this age bracket, especially with than Jacques Fresco. And thank you, Roxanne, too, for both of you coming on for this segment of the show. Jacques, you talk about the global resource-based economy. Because the economy, we all know, and you brought it out in the first segment, segment, both of you, that war has been a driver of the economy. And we've had the Honorable Paul Hellyer, Paul Hellyer, the former Minister of Defense on the show, talking about a new economy, and he also wants to hear more about your global resource-based economy, because this is a relatively new concept. It's been discussed at much lower levels in communities. There's a lot of bartering going on or co-op gardening, but how are you seeing, what do you see to be the global resource-based economy, and how do we relate to it in our communities? We, We have to eventually bring all the nations together as one nation. In other words, there can't be all these separate nations teaching people different things. We have to use a scientific method. Scientists can communicate with anybody. And they always come to the same conclusions. They don't have any different conclusions. We need to use a systems approach, a global systems approach. You know, people are afraid of centralization, but when you have your, um, say, a metaphor, electrical tentacles out into the soil and out into the environment, you can make more appropriate decisions. And when you know what's going on all over the world, you can coordinate things more easily. It's not that you can introduce, or it's not that you can initiate a resource-based economy in your own community. Um, We want to start with a system that, I mean, excuse me, with a city that Jacques designed. And we, we feel that it's easier to build new sustainable cities from the ground up, ground up and then to try and restore or retrofit old ones. So the new cities will take advantage of the latest technologies and the clean and self uh, safe and desirable places, be safe and desirable place to live. Um, in many instances, it'll be circular and, as I mentioned, interchangeable parts. And so you use all your best architects and engineers and systems people and, and multidisciplinarian people working together to design very well that one eighth and then duplicate it. And this conserves resources. And within the city, they would be doing a survey of available planetary resources so we know what to plan for. We would be doing the planning toward a resource-based economy, toward organizing the global society to this direction uh, of making goods and services available to everybody. It becomes a production and distribution problem which is easy easy to solve. You know, they do that on individual industry approaches, but not on a global scale to take care of the needs of everyone. They do it on an industry that's competing with another industry. But we want to turn that system, the systems approach, open to the world to make everybody's lives better. So the city would be working toward making the next city more automated, more cybernated, going up quicker, better use of materials. It would be um, working on clean sources of energy. So it would be working on approaches so we can house and feed everybody 
on a transition period, because people are going hungry even today all over. We need to be able to feed them quickly, quick houses temporarily, temporarily so they can house themselves. Methods of having hospitals that might float temporarily to one country dock and bring them up so they can build, we can build their own hospitals. First, we need a survey of what's happening all over the world, where the resources are, where the technical personnel are, where how the health of the people, the arable land, where the water is. And from that, we can plan, for instance, where the hospitals go and where we build cities and have a tremendous network from one city to the other. You know, if you don't have resources in a place like Iceland and another country does, you, but the other country doesn't have technical personnel, we share that. Um, and we organize that globally. So you don't do things like take water from one country and ship it across the sea to another country. That's absurd. Um, so the cities would be working on on preparing the next step for a global resource-based economy. It would be a huge learning center of how to perpetuate this and what the values are. And it would be a huge media center and producing movies and books. We think movies are a great way to do this because it doesn't, people are against anybody who stands up and talks about it, but the movie can show more of what we're missing in the future and what we could have, what our earth could look like if we, if we eventually share our resources or have access to resources. Sometimes the word share is a red flag because people think they have to give up something, but you don't have to give up anything when you produce abundance and enable everybody to have access to resources. So those are some of the things we'd be doing in the first city. And we want to really test the validity of this direction. We have to test it and that we can do in the first city. And where are you now in the development process? What, at what stage are you? Well, Jacques has been making designs for this since he was 13 or 14. I know that sounds preposterous, but it's true. Um, and he's been perfecting his designs since I've known him, which is about 41 years. We have lately archived all his blueprints that we've done a lot of blueprints together because he taught me how to do technical illustration, model making, and uh, he taught me on his designs, which were really fascinating. So I helped in some of the blueprints as well. Uh, so we've been archiving his work, and over the last 41 years, we've digitized recently 5,500 of his sketches that when you're designing a, a totally new system, they're, they're, he's a multidisciplinarian, and they're designs for all aspects of society, from medical devices to clean sources of energy to bridges, clean sources of transportation, efficient transportation, to hundreds of city designs. You know, they wouldn't look all the same. It depends on the needs of the people and where it's located and what the use of the city is for. So um, we've done a lot of work and we have many blueprints. We we really need help with people. We have devoted from people. We've devoted our lives and all of our money for this. But it's only two people and there's so much to do. So. We've developed a research center in Venus, Florida, that's 21 acres. We purchased it ourselves. We had no outside funding. We built 10 structures here. I did, I mixed the cement in a wheelbarrow and troweled it on. It, um, it doesn't look like a hand tool environment here, but we, we tried to build some, we came here in 1980 to build and demonstrate some of Jacques' designs. And mostly we did that with with buildings. We couldn't build what we wanted to build. We could only build what we could afford to build because we took out no mortgages. So, and during that time in the last, I guess, within 20 years, Jacques, it was mostly Jacques because I had a business, as you mentioned in the beginning, and I helped support the project. But Jacques 
was making models of, we have over 400 models of what the future could be like here. So it's like an exhibit of the future. And recently there's a museum in Naples that took 54 of the models and many, many of his sketches and did a, a timeline of his life around this room. So um, every Saturday we give tours and Jacques and I speak and talk about this direction and we show people around the grounds and we describe the models. So many people come from all over the world. We do, we purchase, we publish our own books. We, um, we try and make, keep constantly making videos. And we, if you go to our website and look up our YouTube channel, the Venus project media, uh, you'll find a lot of lectures. You, you'll, our latest documentary, which is an hour and a half, I encourage you to watch because it's it's really a nice tribute to Jacques. What's the name of it? It's called The Choice is Ours, and it's on our home page on our website. And you'll also see a little four-minute video on, on the acceptance of, of Jacques' award at the UN that he just got for city design and a resource-based economy. Um what else? So we are working on a major motion picture. We have been doing that for a while. It takes longer than we expected, but we are not giving up. We think they're just like cowboys and Indian movies. There were hundreds of them. There needs to be hundreds of movies and different scenarios about a resource-based economy and a positive future along these lines. Mm -hmm. So uh, to introduce it to many different types of people in different ways, you can't do one movie that reaches everybody. So we're, we're working on all those things. And just recently we've acquired a nonprofit organization called Resource Based Economy that has the bylaws large enough so we can do many cities and do philanthropic cities because we are not doing them as typical real estate ventures where we're selling things. We are keeping it clean to the direction to help perpetuate the direction of a resource based economy. So you can't buy your way in, but you can, if you want to donate and, and it is a nonprofit organization and you want to live and work there, that's fine and help. But if you want to help donate to a sane and sustainable future, we encourage you to do that to the resource based economy nonprofit. So um, we do have already plans and designs. We need to do the final blueprints and the engineering for, you know, using our the blueprints that we already have and the designs of Jacques. We're kind of at that stage at this time and organizing the nonprofit to initiate the first city. And um, Jacques, I, I know, has many uh, books. You both have videos, books, and things on that website. I want to encourage everyone to go to the Venus Project. Uh, is it .com website? Yeah. And look at the videos, look at the books, and purchase them. But the nonprofit is good to know about, too, Resource-Based Economy, a 501c3 for those who need a tax write-off for the donations. I think it's a wonderful idea for people to go and live and work there, too. I had a couple of people just drop me notes that asked if they how you relate to the international people who want to come and work. So I hear that you saying they can, yes? Well, we have chapters all over the world. We have points of contact all over the world. And it, this is not a United States organization because we, we don't, this might shock people. We don't believe in patriotism. Einstein said patriotism is a disease. It separates people. Um, we, we all have the same goals and the needs all over the world. And, um, this is when, when Jack was very young, he ran into trouble because his grandfather said, um, Jacques, don't pledge your allegiance to the earth, to the, to the United States. Pledge your allegiance to the earth and everyone on it. And when he didn't pledge allegiance to the flag when he was very young, about 13, his teacher pulled him into, by the ear, into the principal's office. And, um, the principal said he was a strange man and he said, well, you're excused. And he put his arm around Jacques and he said, why don't you want to pledge allegiance to to the United States. And Jacques explained how people came here from all over the world. 
and you know our our language is butch english the arabs gave us the algebra and um you know einstein was um a german and louis pasteur we might not be alive if it wasn't for pasteur some of us and he was a frenchman and the principal bought him what he wanted roped off the back of the class for him i think it was about 13 or 14 and bought the books he wanted to read and he had to come once a week to give him a report on the books and the principal said he learned a lot but this is Jacques Start where he he read books like Mind in the Making and Thorsten Veblen and um and about tropism and Jacques Loeb so at a very young age he had a very different start uh and he knows where his all his inventions came from it didn't just come from the ether and and he he never says that he's a genius or he, he's a product of his own environment what he went through so i don't remember your original question <laughs> oh, <laughs> good no <laughs> this was about the international uh, oh, viewpoint yeah. and the co- yeah. the connections that you have which is you've explained thank you because i know that people will be very interested in this internationally who are hearing this show many people for the first time will be hearing about the venus project and others have been looking forward to your update which is excellent good um, and, and people we work with people from all over the world we have teams from people all over the world and we are we are just updating our teams and how you can get involved but if you go to our website immediately you can see how you can get involved we also give courses a very good two year course where we go through a lot of materials we're working on a one year course where we have before people get involved shortly they will be doing a little course just a 10 hour course on the internet because we want to make sure they understand our direction because a lot of people here maybe one movie or two movies and then they think they understand it but it's it really takes a long time to put a lot of the things together it's quite extensive and we have lots of materials uh we have 600 hours of Jacques lectures from the 60s 70s and 80s that he used to give in his home when people used to come um we don't have all of them out but we're working on on that we we have a transcription team we have a graphics team we have a social media pe- team that puts something up every few hours we have um the educational teams and and many more so we 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 have the um public relations team and human re- human resources and so we really we we welcome a lot of help if you identify with this direction and we'll help you learn about it as well. And we have the archives, the show archives on American Freedom Radio where the show will be archived as well it will be on YouTube uh by the time people hear this so you can look it up on YouTube the Carol Rosen show with Jacques Fresco and with Roxanne Meadows um but now we also have the people listening in I would like to encourage to network this I know that we have a lot of people so we don't have a count that tune in to the show on americanfreedomradio.com. You can also contact me at space treaty one word space treaty at gmail.com for any questions or if you haven't for any reason been able to reach Jacques and Roxanne I'll be glad to um channel your communications to them. The media is very important to get involved in this and I saw your amazing video called The Choice is Ours which is on your website uh the venusproject.com. This is something that I think everyone should watch because it takes you from the problems into the actual choices that we have. and that to me is the bottom line of where we're going with this entire project that you're working on it is that we have these choices now or we're leading to our extinction and that process is underway with full force anyone who doesn't believe that should listen to the show by shows by Dr. Guy McPherson that we've had on the air but also uh like you 
we've had many people in the show that support your efforts that are uh, people like I mentioned, Paul Hellyer with his new economic viewpoint, Asha Deliverance, who talks about the Buckminster Fuller Domes. She founded Pacific Domes and helped set them up around the world. I'm mentioning these because these are people that you may want to get in touch with, too. Uh, Dr. Will Tuttle, who gives talks all over the world about veganism, vegetarianism, uh, we have uh, Commander Scott Jones, who founded the Peace and Emergency Action Coalition for Earth, which I'm an executive director of. And he it, and we're all working on the different emergency situations that we're in, but also uh, the issue of the cosmos, contact cultures and so on. There's a lot in that field that many people are interested in that relate to this, but we're not going into that on this particular show. We I do want to mention uh, Robbie Graham who distinguishes between fiction and fact. And one of the things that I really appreciate that you're doing is you're dealing with facts. There's so much disinformation out there. And I wonder if you experience the blocks, the discrediting campaigns and so on. I don't want to dwell on that, but I wonder if that is an experience of yours. It is for so many of us who are trying to get the truth out there. Well, Actually, we don't pay much attention to that. <laughs> don't, we don't spend much time with that. Um, we, most of the people that we hear from are, are very supportive and very appreciative. So, um, it, Great. yeah, we just, it's just so much to do that, you know, they always say every new invention, every new idea, they always say it'll never happen. Not in a thousand years. Want to go with that with the space station? No. Yeah, I, I just want to say that Shock used to do special effects for Hollywood, too. I don't know what he didn't do. You know, he did medical devices. You can walk, look at his resume. But um, he would have people say to him when he would do space stations and people going to the moon, he'd say, you'd never see that, not in a thousand years. And he would say, oh, do you work with propulsion? No. Are you a rocket engineer? No. Then where do you come off with these opinions? Everybody in this culture is given the right to their own opinions. And we say that that's really dangerous. In the future, you won't be taught that, but you would have access to accurate information. And that's quite different. That's really different. And, and with that, Jacques, um, because this is what you focus on, it is uh, a state of higher learning that doesn't happen in most schools that I know of as an educator. So I'm wondering if you could talk more about how you have hope uh, for a future of humankind in this technological age, in the age of machines. Do you have hope for our future that we're going to survive on this planet? In the future, since people do not work for any companies, they work to improve life on Earth. And so, they are very different kinds of people. They, they would be very different in their behavior and their values. Do you have hope for people? I don't know. All I do is the best I can. Yes. Would you speak then to um, how your vision relates to solving the problems of the planet specifically like the racial tensions that we see going on around the world to the lawlessness, um, the different kind of law that you talk about that could help eliminate the crime and pro poverty. How right. does the Venus Project relate to all of that? There's no Japanese way of building that place. It's an engineering method. And that's what we have to use, science and technology is the only solution to the world problems if we recognize that. And then you have so many people, though, that are afraid of the artificial intelligence, the automated technologies that can be turned into weapons. But you're talking about a, what sounds like to me a much more sane and intelligent approach to science and engineering. Do you get a good response from scientists and engineers to your vision? Yes. Great. And when you lecture, what 
are the main messages now that you would like to give to your audiences? They come to, to the tours on Saturday and learn more about it. Well, essentially, too, that all of the Earth's resources become the common heritage of all Earth's people. And that we use a systems approach for designing a total global resource-based economy and use our, our, our technology wisely to enhance people's lives. Nothing destructive. <clears throat> You know, we have coming on the show um, a lady named Amara Angelica who deals with the latest uh, innovations and in technologies. Who's going to love what you're talking about, of course, and contribute the ideas, ideas I know, to what you're doing. But now we also have this new president of the United States. I know politics are not what we're talking about here because we have to create the reality ourselves, as you're saying. But we have a president coming in who is a developer. He develops projects and real estate. And is there, he says he would like to do deals, for example, with Putin instead of wars, just one example, deals instead of wars. Would you, if you had him in front of you, what would you say to this new president now? Because he sounds like he might be on the path to understanding and maybe be able to pull people together to help support Jacques and your, your vision of the Venus Project. What would you say to this president-elect who in just a few days, by the time people listen to this, will be the president of the United States? I say question everything. Look at everything with skepticism. Be very careful of what you accept or reject. Because it depends on the future, what you do today. The decisions that we make today will enter the future. But they better be real rather than spectacular. And more, what would you say to him about developing and making choices? Because he is says he's going to be working in community development, in his whole uh, talk about that is emphasizing jobs, jobs, jobs. What would you say to him about that? Because you have a different viewpoint about this. Yes, because we think that automation will take over most professions. And whether we like it or not, or whether the Venus Project advocates it or not, this is what's happening. It's taking over, it will build, it's building buildings, you know, 3D printing. It, there, um, Jacques has a method of extruding buildings that's even quicker. It's on our website. Um, when even the white collar jobs are going to be phased out. So a new system has to come about where we use science and technology with human concern. And where all the Earth's resources are held, held as the common heritage of all the Earth's people. And then we can truly say that there is intelligent life on Earth. Uh, right now, we don't know. It doesn't look like it. So, I, you know, we would say to him, just explain, just like we explain to anybody else, of a, of a, a new direction that we should move toward. And the alternative is just devastating. We think eventually politicians will have to turn to something like this or they'll be thrown out. But as we said, politicians are really there to serve other interests, not our interests, and to keep things as they are. So it's up to people to understand this that and stop waiting for others to do it for you and join with us and see if we can make this a reality. I think there is no other way. And how do you relate to laws? Because right now there are people, uh, there's so much lawlessness. There's so much crime and corruption. How will the Venus Project and your vision relate to the laws in this society and the social problems that we're experiencing? Well, laws are a byproduct of an insufficient society. Who makes the laws don't steal people that have things? As long as you have deprivation 
and people that don't have enough to live on, and they see other people with, um, you know, 10 houses and, and opulence, and they push it on the, inter- on the Internet and on advertising. You know, we're, we experience 6,000 advertisements in the day in a large city. It, it, when you get rid of deprivation and you make goods and services available, you don't have to write laws, don't steal. You don't have to build prisons to put people in there that do that. So um, we look for the root causes of the problem in society and change the society so people are not deprived, they are not aberrant, they can be cooperative and participate in society and contribute to it. You know, it's cheaper to, to, as I said, give people education than put them in jail. Jail is a good business today. And as Jacques mentioned, they don't come out any smarter. <laughs> no, in no. fact, we, Jacques has talked about, I know, the the ignorance, the, the stupidity of what's going on on this planet. It seems to me to be slightly insane in our decision-making processes along the way. But I'm wondering, when you're designing your animated models, your illustrations, computer animation and so on when you have that those drawings ready and you do many of them do you have a way to get them to the policy makers so to speak i mean we are the real policy makers but the ones who are entering say the white house for example or the new military offices i I don't know if i can reach them but i can try all right and we have no access to them. If there are people that um, that know certain people that they think that this would be important to approach them with, we'd be glad to hear from them. My e- personal email, I will give you my personal email. You can reach me at Meadows, that's my last name, M-E-A-D-O-W-S, Meadows at thevenusproject.com. And that will reach Jacques as well. Very good. We do have listening in, by the way, um, in from from Russia, living in different countries as well, some innovators, inventors, and a, a leading media person that also speaks and writes in Russian. So um, he will, I'm sure, be putting a lot of these words into translation. It was years ago that I met the cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova and she reminded me of the hundreds of thousands of people who were killed in Russia that in the United States we just haven't experienced that we have different actions where you see uh, people being blown up now or you know riots happening and so on but in your Venus project in the city of design that you're coming up with and you mentioned that there won't be this kind of crime because people will get everything they want. Do you have somebody in the diff- are the people in different countries describing what they want? Because wouldn't it be different in each culture in each country? Yes, we do have people in different countries who can select more appropriate directions than are selected today. Mm-hmm. And we do feel that all people need, as we mentioned before, clean air and water, arable land, relevant education to to perpetuate the resource-based economy, not to perpetuate being a lawyer or a banker or an advertising person or a stock broker. You know, those would be obsolete in the future. But people who can contribute, um, so to the to our needs and um, they all need clean sources of energy and there's so much to do just in that getting efficient housing that doesn't get blown away you know um, it, it doesn't depend on the cheapest bidder for a part so there there's so much to do <laughs> 
And in the environmental world, then, you know, and, and you're right, there is so much to do, especially in the what we call developing world, although in the United States it's a mess too. Um, and we have so much in the environmental um, situations that we have to deal with and energy and so on. But I wonder, how does the environment itself, the cultures, um, impact the behavior, the thought process to – of the people who relate or could relate to the to the Venus Project, do you see how environmental inf how the environment influences behavior and thoughts? When we and, come to the tour, they'll be shown the alternative methods of dealing with problems. And we advocate that it is strictly the environment that gives you your thought process, and it it's such a subtle manipulation that we really don't know where it comes from sometimes, but it comes from your books, from your religious leaders, from your parents, from your role models, from your subculture, from the movies that you see, from the Internet. It all gives you your values. You really can't exceed your environment. So that's why we, we understand that it's so important to create another environment that doesn't doesn't make people hostile, that that doesn't keep people in perpetual stress, that um, where your needs are taken care of, you know, and that's that's the beginning of the civilized world from then on. Right now, we're at a stage they probably won't even look at us, us in history other than just one nation fighting and grabbing and bombing another nation for what they want. And this was pretty much our history. Yeah, well, to me, I see a lot of the countries being seduced into these wars that really have tremendous problems that could be solved if they were not involved. And it's like they want the financial assistance, extended business and trade, a seat in the groups like NATO, um, and so to imagine them working on a resource-based economy to get that information to them, find leaders who will support it. I hope the listeners will look for those people because building this architecture of a circular city sounds like an amazingly sane arrangement. Um, could you talk more about the uh, how you would also – relate to the energy crisis because it sounds like when you're describing this that you're going to need a lot of energy to build these circular cities. Well, you know, even this culture has, has it states that we do have enough energy. They have done plans. Uh, I think the Mark Jacobson, who was in our last documentary, they have um, calculated that they can <clears throat> produce a high energy society with wind, with solar, with geothermal, many other clean sources of energy. There's no reason to perpetuate this dirty energy anymore of, you know, fracking and oil and gas. And so we just don't need it. But politically, they run the show and they have access to, to the media. You know, they advertise and if you don't, you don't want to say anything, they don't want to say anything against their advertisers. So it's a, it's a perpetual loop of being trapped into this system. Um, so there are other methods and that's what we would use as well. And Jack has right. had many different designs for alternative energy systems that we wanted to try out here, but we never had, we never had the funds. So we were limited as to what we could do. Well, somebody's going to do this, I'm sure, because what you're talking about is such a, a vision. And Jacques, just say, um, now I, I always watch on TV tiny houses on wheels. And I, I'm very familiar with, um, earthship houses that grow the food in the house and have the water system set up. And I'm wondering because of the population explosion too, in your system, do you have things like skyscrapers, places to live in apartment dwellings and how would that be set up? What would that look like? Well, it would look like more well, like a lab than an apartment. It would look like a building designed for people, not for 
for experiments only. Um, if you go to our website, you can see some of the designs that Jack has. He has a lot of designs for high rises and total enclosure systems. The high rises, we think most people would want to live in them in the future because it has everything that they need. It has health care, it has child care, it has hobby areas, it has entertainment, it has restaurants, you know, and um, and pools and things that, that they might need. Medical attention to a degree would be there as well. Um, houses have, which shows hundreds of house designs, but they really use more materials and use more walls, and you have to travel to different places of the city that that you don't have to travel as much within the high rise. So he does show a lot of high rises in his cities. And so it sounds like you'll have a self-sustaining kind of living conditions with water facilities and um, a wide variety, probably ways of growing food as well, maybe without pesticides and GMOs and all that. Absolutely. It would be all organic. And it could be done on a massive scale, but each city has their own food. On the, on the outer rim of the city is the food. And Jack also has designs where you can grow it on the rooftops as well. So you don't have to travel. The food doesn't have to travel that far, even from the out, outside ring of the city. But um, all that would be taken into account because you would design the city from the ground up and and organize all that with the latest technologies for the health of people. Which is going to be primary because each area is experiencing different kinds of environmental, some catastrophes and earth changes and so on, not to mention weather and pollution, radiation, methane. Do you, um, Jacques and, and Roxanne, have hope that we will be able to do things like clean up the waterways from the radiation? What do we do with methane on the planet? Are you dealing with these heavy issues Yes, we can deal with that. If you organize science and technology solely to deal with those kind of things, they come up with the, pro that does, with the solutions. When, when they asked them, can we get to the moon, you know, if they had the resources, it's not the money that we have to ask how much it costs. It's do we have the resources and the brain power for people and technicians and scientists working on on how to eliminate scarcity and, and the well-being of people. Um, that's the real aim. We can deal with problems. And, and if there is a shortage of something, that's what they would be working on, substitutes for that. So they've never really had problems of taking care of those things. We're, we're, we're kind of pushing ourselves to the limit, though. Jacques, in The Choice is Ours, he has an interesting approach to the rising sea sea levels and you know in Miami in the low areas the the roads are getting flooded and they're using pumps to plump it pump it out already and they're building the roads above the roadways new roads so Jacques has a a design in the choices ours where it's an automated canal digger and um you make canals from the right from the waters the ocean waters directly to below sea level deserts and we calculated that even in the worst conditions of rising seawater that we have twice as much um, desert area where no people are to bring the canals would make um, would, would dig the canals directly to the below sea level areas and we would bring the water the rising sea levels to those areas to contain it this would also make the deserts bloom again Yes, and, and that's such a, an important factor because all over the world we know the waters are rising on the coastlines. Um, whole areas and islands are disappearing already. Yes, it, and they're not dealing with it. No, and they don't know how to. Uh, we, we have ancient methods that people are now studying, you know, with circular ways of keeping water if they have water at all. But I'm on the west coast or near the west, the very near west coast of um, Oregon. And we, we have people moving up here from California because it's so dry. The water's disappearing. They're giving away their champion horses because there's not enough water and food. It's a really sad situation and it's only going to get worse. So I think people really need to listen to these innovations that you're presenting. So when people are living in your research centers in your cities, um, and 
people can then, if they build them around the world experiments and work with you, uh, they can get feedback from you and ideas. Is that right? If they communicate with you for what they can do in different parts of the world? Yes, I, I, we would ask people to join with us for the first city and and learn as much as they can about this and work with us initially to do the first city. And then we would be using that city and that center for research and development to make new cities very quickly and very efficiently. And we would spread them through evolution instead of revolution, as Jacques says. And so people can uh, contact you and subscribe to different platforms that you have, I understand, uh, if they become a volunteer or if they want to reach you. What kind of platforms do you have, like newsletters? Uh, how do, can people tune yeah. into what you're doing? Thank you. Yes, we have a newsletter on the bottom of our website on every page. Um, shortly it will be on every page. We just redid it. And um, – and, and in the newsletter, we will be asking for different disciplines that we need and the, when we work on different projects, but we ask people to keep up with it through our newsletter. On um, Our website is thevenusproject.com. You need the in front of it, thevenusproject.com. And do you have Facebook, Twitter, those other kinds of social networks? Yes, absolutely. We have a huge group of volunteers that have all that. On the bottom of our website, you can see all the social networks that we do have. So you have Facebook, Twitter, probably Google pages or groups? Yes, all the ones that I can think of. <laughs> we do. Instagrams. Yeah. Uh, I don't have all of this myself, but I think it's fabulous that you do. Um, the printerist accounts, YouTubes. I've seen many of your lectures. Um, and uh, Jacques, your lectures on YouTube are absolutely incredible. They go back so many years. And you do have some recent ones. I think the one you're doing here is as condensed as one I've heard anywhere. So I hope people will network this one too. The choice is um, ours, right? Yes, and your video, The Choice is Ours, is, that's on your website. You also mentioned the volunteers, and you have people – do you have people doing your web development, transcriptions, well, things we like that? Do need, we do need more help with the web development. We're just now doing a, our, um, our new website for resource-based economy. We need help with web development. We have volunteers, uh, but we need more. And um, – we do have trans, we have a transcription team that's transcribing a lot of Jacques old lectures and other things. So we can do educational materials with them and do more videos with them. We have, um, as you mentioned, our YouTube channel, Joel Holt keeps that up and does a beautiful job. He did a lot of the editing and the videography for the, um, the choices ours. Our YouTube channel is the Venus Project Media, and this is all on the bottom of our website, too, on our pages. Um, we have a linguistic team. When we did the Choices Ours, the last documentary, which was an hour and a half, we held it up for about two and a half weeks, and we had very professional volunteers who transcribed it into tw about 20 different languages, and they have perfected their work over the years, so they check themselves a lot. Um, we could never have paid for all that. Um, there's many people who really want to see this progress and happen, so they work at it. You know that saying that if, um, if you do nothing, you can be assured that nothing will happen. We don't want just well-wishers. We need people to help us because we there's you know there's a lot that they can help us with. We have the poster department. We have editing department, transcription department, the web, um, an, an educational course. We would love to have people go through our educational course. The largest one, the longest one is two years, working an hour a day. And when they finish that, then they teach other people as well. And they get a very good idea of what this is about. It, it's quite extensive, as I mentioned. Um, for the ladies and gentlemen, and the chil including the children, young people who are listening, um, this couple has put together a project that 
you can't learn about in school. I want to encourage people to take the trip to go to visit uh, Jacques Fresco and, and Roxanne Meadows at the Research Center in Florida, which you can find more out about. And visit, as Jacques is encouraging you to do, go to the seminars and tours that are taking place every Saturday, and you can make appointments for different times, too, I'm sure. But this is over 80 years of work to improve a system that is not working on this planet that's causing so many problems, and it's why I'm doing this show. And because we have these very special guests on, I hope you will network and share, because these are real solutions. You have just heard explanations of many aspects of the system, and there's so much more that is about how things can work and will work if you can help develop a resource-based economy and these new ways of living and thinking. You can find all of that out through the lectures, not just through this show, but through the lectures, through the websites and all of the resources. And you can also donate so that the Venus Project can maintain its research center in Venus and build model cities. And so there are over a thousand audio and visual recordings that I know of that stretch right up to the present, but back through decades that you can learn from. Um, and we can reach the people around the world. My formula is you can reach anyone. We're three or four people away from anyone you want to meet. So if we want to get this vision and this information to President Trump, to the leaders of the world, many of whom have already spoken about world peace and they need peace, they need solutions, they need to manage the resources in their locales and their man-made boundaries and geographical boundaries. We can do that, the people listening to this show. What do you see as time limits or do you see how time works, Jacques and um, Roxanne, to – actually build a city that you're talking about what is the time limit or constraint on you so there really isn't one if people contribute they, they have to have time with those people that's the only limit well building this city would be faster and more efficient than any other city that they have you know 40 years ago when i met jock 41 years ago and he would talk about building new cities from the ground up. They thought he was preposterous, but they're doing it today. But they're chaotic. They're not as planned and efficient as Jacques cities. So they would go up very quickly. Um, so, And that's what we need, ladies and gentlemen. We need for this to go up very quickly. We're at the end of this segment of this show. I thank you so much for being on the show. It's a classic. It's a treasure. And I'm thrilled to be able to share you with other people. Everybody get to this, uh, to the whole contact list that you have. The, give, give your contact again one more time. Um, the website is thevenusproject.com. My email that will get to Jacques as well is meadows, M-E-A-D-O-W-S, at thevenusproject.com. Let's all focus on this and have peace on earth, and we can do this quickly, as they're saying. It's just up to us. The choice is ours. Much love and peace to everyone. No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio.